Hola mi gente, you are listening to Dancing into Parenthood, the Entre la Familia series, where Latinos get to hear our stories about raising our children with special needs. I am your host, Dr. Divina Lopez, board certified pediatrician for over 10 years and mom to a little boy with autism and ADHD. My motherhood journey has been my greatest inspiration to creating this podcast because when it comes to our community, we have unique circumstances that we keep entre la familia that we need to share and no longer keep quiet about. On this show, I will give you the tools, information, and strategies to raising a happy and healthy human being. Each week, I am connecting you with other Latino families who have generously shared their personal journeys and struggles so that you can have clarity and insight on what it takes to raise such a special child. Before the episode starts, I want to remind you to follow us on social so you don't miss out on all the support I love to share with you. You can find us on Instagram, YouTube, TikTok at Dr. Divina Lopez and any place that you hang out on the internet. Also, I can't wait to start the parent sessions. We're starting group parent sessions and I want you to be there. I want to help guide you if you are struggling with parenthood, if you don't have support, if you're insecure about the choices that you're making for your child, if you just want to get it right for your child, then I encourage you to join the 12 week program where we will meet once a week and I will teach you how to advocate for your child, how to navigate the medical system, how to navigate the educational system, where to find your support system, and how to build healthy family relationships so we can break those toxic cycles, create boundaries with family members, and also learn to love ourselves through it all. All right, mi gente, I want to see you there. So make sure that you go to my website and that you drop your email in there. That way you are the first to know when the group sessions start. Now let's get into the episode. Welcome back to Dancing into Parenthood. Today, I have a very, very special guest with me, Lenelli Nieves. Uh, I actually met her not too long ago. She is a speech therapist, and she also does feeding therapy, which I love because these are two areas where our children with autism are usually delayed and where we need to help and give them services and catch them up. I love Nanali for a few reasons. One is that she has a really beautiful personality. Like she has a very nice energy. She's super chill, but she's really, really knowledgeable. Um, So I, I felt like everything that she added to the event that we did together was like super on point. And I wanted for other people to hear the way she practices, because I find that it's a little bit unique. And um, I also love that she's Latina also. She's from the New York area. Um, She's servicing the Bronx and also Queens and Long Island. Am I right about that? Oh, Queens and and parts of Brooklyn, yes. Oh, and Brooklyn too. Yes. (laughs) Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. A little all over. (laughs) Yeah. But, you know, as we met and we were talking, it's so funny because she actually is currently... Um, servicing a school where I do work at. And I was like, you know, it was just meant to be, right? It was very much meant to be for us to meet and to do this podcast episode. And you actually, um, the second speech um, speech pathologist that I've had on the podcast, the first um, speech pathologist that I had, she was talking to my new parents, right? So that was when the podcast first came out I wanted her to just talk about like some of the speech delay things like what do we see and stuff like that right now that I've pivoted and this whole series of Entre La Familia was really created for the community um, where I've invited all the Latino parents to come on and share their experience of what it's like to raise um, a child with autism 
I think it's important to just have somebody focus on what do our children need. And you also have a son, right, with autism. And so um, I I, I personally believe that that has made my practice of pediatrics better. Do you feel that way too? Like it, it just helps to make your practice and your therapy um, better because of what you do yes, with your son, your mothering and all of that. I think that it definitely, it's a different lens. You know, I mm -hmm. think that as a professional you know, you're trained to be that professional. And, you know, I think motherhood does not come with instructions. So once you have like the mom lens, it's totally different. And then it, for me personally, it just, it really switches the, my approach to therapy and the way that I approach parents and speak to parents, because now it's not only from the professional lens, but also from my mom lens and you know, it's just a combination of both things. So I 100% agree with you on that. Yeah. Yeah. I, for me, it made a world of a difference with the compassion that I could bring and just understanding them better. Because I remember thinking, you know, sometimes the parents were just like so anxious about certain things, and I didn't understand why. And then after having my son, it's like, oh, yeah, now I totally yeah. get it, right? It's just because you're always trying to do your best. You're always trying to make sure you don't miss anything and that you're providing everything that you can for your child. And then, um, you know, as a professional, I feel when you blend those two things together, it's really like good, right? Then your practice yeah. becomes even better because you come with this love for it, right? It's like you you see yourself in all of these parents, you see your son in all of the children. And so I think, you know, that really helps to just make everything that much better. And, and people notice that also, right? Like then they only want to come to you. They don't want to see anybody else because they see what you bring to the table, right? Um, so, you know, getting back to the event, I think, you know, when I... Because I, I think when I first like entered the room, you were just very quiet and everything. So, okay, you know, I'm also a quiet person unless people approach me, right? <laughs> um, so I, I, I could engage anything. But as soon as we sat down and we started going, you know, um, through the panel, I was like, ooh, she, she knows exactly <laughs> what she's talking about. And I love that so Thank much you. because you were very quiet. But when it came to speaking, you knew what to say and you knew what was important for people to hear um so you know I, I want you to introduce yourself talk because you know yourself better than anybody else I'm not the best at introducing people <laughs> I want you to to talk about you know what because you had a whole story that day and I loved it if you would share that story a little bit um about like where did your love for for doing your work come from Absolutely. Absolutely. So thank you for the introduction. It was wonderful meeting you as well. Um, and thank you for having me. I appreciate your time. So my name, like I said, like you introduced me, it's Lina Lee Nieves. Um, I've been in practice for over seven years. Um, initially, I had started in the adult world. So mm -hmm. after graduation, I actually moved to Texas to complete my clinical fellowship mm -hmm. year. And I worked with adults post-stroke and traumatic brain injuries because that is my passion, like the medical world of, the, of speech pathology. Um, during 2020, during the pandemic, I decided to move back home and mm -hmm. still working with adults um, in numerous settings. But um, recently, I've developed an interest in working um, in the pediatric world, specifically with kids with pediatric feeding disorders. Um, my nephew, who is now six, is also on the spectrum, and he was really one of the reasons why um, I decided to go into this. Um, yeah. As a child with autism, he has a very selective menu. Mm -hmm. um, and I really wanted to help my sister with him and try to find other ways to, to ex expose him to different types of foods. Mm -hmm. um, my son will be two in January mm -hmm. and he mm -hmm. was recently diagnosed as well and with him it's the language yeah. um, my son has a speech delay he receives speech therapy and I've noticed that um, 
the goals that were created for him don't re really align with my vision as a mom. Um, yeah, yeah. And I think as far as, and like we mentioned earlier, you know, having the professional lens and the mom lens, it's kind of like, you know, I've, I've, I've had experiences where we've gone to doctor's appointments and the doctors don't know what I do. So they're telling me right. all these things and I'm just like, um, yeah. no, that's, that's not what I want for him. Exactly what, yeah. what work for him. <laughs> yeah. By the way, I'm X, Y, Z. And then it's like, mm -hmm. oh, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. You know, then so, um, yeah. Right. Like the attitude changes, the whole the conversation changes, changes, everything. I right. do the same yeah. thing. Like I never tell people I'm a pediatrician at all. Like never. They find out later on, maybe because of, you know, whatever comes up in conversation or something like that. And then they're like, Oh, are you in the medical field? Or, um, and then, you know, depending on who it is, then maybe I'll, I'll, I'll change it. But like, it's a shame that it takes that to change yes. the conversation or to take you more seriously or to right. see you in a different way, especially right. as Latinas, because we are oftentimes overlooked as being the professionals, right. As having the, the expertise, expertise, in this right. Field, right. And, you know, it, it, it is a shame, but it's also, it kind of like works to our advantage because people just undermine us all the time. Right. So I, I love when people undermine me because I'm like, yeah, you don't know who I am or what I know. Right. right. And I'm going to be quiet here and I'm going to let you go on and on. And then I'll let you know what the real plan is. <laughs> right. But <laughs> That's why when you mentioned that I was quiet. So I think over the years, I've learned to kind of just watch the room and, and observe. watch and observe. Yeah. And then, you know, you, you come out, yeah. but, um, that that's a little bit about my background and um like I said now I'm kind of not pivoting because I still love my adults I still love mm -hmm. helping after stroke recovery after traumatic brain injury uh yes. re yeah. rehabilitating the swallow helping with the speech that's still my passion but yeah. um it, my career has pivoted slightly with with now I'm really trying to focus on helping this this community because there is yeah. such there is such, such, such a need, Huge need. in the Huge pediatric need. feeding world. Um, yes. The kids with special needs, it's just, you know, also the lack of education. Sometimes parents just yeah. don't know any better and they trust the yeah. professionals and, and there's not a one size fits all for these kids, yeah. you know? And that's right. It, and, it, and it is hard especially as a new parent. Like I was a new mom and, and, you know, my son didn't latch to my breast. Yeah. My son had a very hard time with bottles. Yeah. I had to go through so many bottle nipples to see what was mm. right for him. And I had no idea, you know, right. that right. he should have been seen by a feeding therapist that we probably should have seen a lactation consultant just so that I can see if there were any other issues. You know, I remember taking him to the ENT because yeah. he was having, he was having trouble sleeping. He was snoring. And I was like, okay, maybe there's something else. And the ENT is like, oh, he's fine. And right. I'm like, right. But I see X, Y, Z. And the ENT is like, Oh no, he's fine. And I said, well, I'm a speech pathologist and this is my concern. And then, then he was like, Oh, okay. Well, and that to me was frustrating. Like, why did I have to say that? Like yeah. I'm his mom and I'm his advocate yeah. and I'm concerned about this and you're just dismissing what I'm telling you, you know? Yeah. And now that you brought that up, let's talk about being an advocate for our kids because, you know, I hate it. <laughs> You know, we have a very similar story. You know, I, I also wouldn't, would never, ever disclose that I'm a doctor. And then I remember the first time going to see the developmentalist and how she was like, oh, he's just quirky, you know, let's just wait and see. And, I, you know, he was already older by then because it took us that long just to even get into a development office. Like, you know, people think I have some special back way to get in. I don't like the wait list is normal for all of us, for right? Everyone. It's yeah. real. It's just real. That's the wait list. And then like, so by the time we got in to see him, because my son is just high functioning, 
He didn't show those signs like early on that a lot of people see with speech delay and stuff like that. As a matter of fact, my kid was a parrot and he always, like he still is, right? He's a parrot. Um, and, and so this piece on advocacy is really important because we do know since we're professionals, like what we should be looking for, asking for, and then we know how to use that part of our expertise to help advocate for our children. It, really hurts me knowing that a lot of moms can't do that, right? They don't know what to say, how to express right. it correctly. Um, they don't know when it's okay to wait um, and when it isn't, right? When we really need to push for certain things. Right. And unfortunately, the way the medical system is now, you have to learn how to do these things, Um and not be afraid to be a squeaky wheel, especially when you feel it intention. Like right. when when you have that intuition telling you like something is not right here right. and you're getting a lot of pushback from the person that you're speaking with. I always encourage people like, look, even if that person is making you think that you might be a little overboard or crazy or whatever, go get a second opinion. Like that's that's at least right. Like go do that because I what's the worst thing that's going to happen that you're just going to get more peace of mind, right? Like absolutely, that's the worst thing that could happen. The best thing is that, okay. Um, you, you went, you made a big fuss, you found another practitioner and that person, that person does find something. Right. And then you get the, the help that you need because you knew that something was off. Right. Absolutely. Um, because I do have a lot of patients that they are so anxious. Right. And, maybe you just need peace of mind, right? Like I, for me personally, if I have a, a parent who's like that, I already know that they are more anxious. Those are the ones that I will over sometimes explain things to, right? Like show them these are all the steps and this is my plan. I always right. tell parents to, to ask for the plan. What is the plan? What if this doesn't work? What's the next step? You right. know, ask for those things and, and go to follow-ups often, Especially Absolutely. if you feel like, oh, they're telling me like six months to a year to come back, but you still feel like something is not right. Schedule right. an appointment, you know, do a follow up and say, hey, I need to be seen a little sooner because this is not improving, right. you know, or I see regression, you know, like, you know, it's actually getting worse. The things that they used to do, they're not doing anymore. You know, what do I do in these in these um, instances? But because culturally, I feel like we are taught to respect the professionals, right. um, which is a beautiful thing. And this is why professionals love working with our community. They yeah. love to work with the, <laughs> with the Latino community because they know this about our culture. Right, right. And, and, it, and, and we're easy. We're easy as patients. Right, because it's like, oh, well, you know, the doctor said to do this. And, you know, I see it. I see it so often even. And it doesn't even matter the age. Like I see it with my grandmother. I see it with like the younger people in my family. And I'm like, guys, this doesn't really seem like this is okay. And oh, well, yeah. you know, that's what so-and-so said. So that's we're what the doctor said. Yeah. You know, the doctor, the dentist, the therapist, whatever. So, so I a hundred percent agree. I think it's, it is kind of embedded in our culture already to kind of just like, oh, see, eso fue lo que me dijo el doctor. And yeah. And it's and just that's like, it. And, that, okay, and that's the okay. word. And yeah. Right. And, and it, it um, happens, it happens very often. And it's, I, I keep hearing the story so often. I mean, it, it happened to my sister with my nephew, like mm -hmm. he, when he was evaluated through early intervention, he was 18 months and he was functioning at a, a nine month old level. And they declined to services. She had to fight. Mm -hmm. And I remember she cried. She called me hysterical telling me that they declined to services. And, yeah. you know, together we worked on an email and, you know, we were able to get him services. And even with my son, like when he got evaluated by the developmental specialist, she was like, oh, he's fine. And I said, really, you don't see X, Y, Z. And she's like, oh, he'll be okay. So I remember during that that initial meeting when he was going to get his services through early intervention and I said, I want, I want this, this and that. Yeah. And they were like, Oh, but why do you want that? And I said, yeah. because I see X, Y, Z. And I, I need to know that he's okay or he needs the extra help. Right. right. Like I need, I need that for him. 
Yeah, that that happened to me with the neurologist when I was like, don't you see that he is on the spectrum? And he was like, oh, yeah, he's definitely on the spectrum. So I'm like, what are you waiting for? How come you haven't diagnosed it? And he was like, oh, well, what do you want from that? Like, he's so high functioning. And I was like, that's not the point. The point right, is that right. once he has his diagnosis, things change for him at school, the kind of like support and services that hey, he's open to getting, right? The absolutely. accommodations that he needs, the modifications that need to be done. So I was right. like, that's why it matters. Matters. It's not because I'm looking for something because they make you they make you feel like I remember feeling like, is he trying to say that I'm like trying to get something out of the system? Like, right. what, what are you trying to say by that statement? Right. Of like, what do you what do you want from this or whatever? It's not that I want something from this. I want to make sure that my son gets what he deserves because exactly. he needs this. Right. And it doesn't matter that he's high functioning. That doesn't mean that he has to struggle more, right? Like, why do right. we need to do this? And why do we need to do this watch and wait business when we know that because they're young, this is the best time the to take best advantage best. and allow their brain to grow in the way that it needs to so they could right. develop the things that they need to develop, right? And 100%. yes, every child on the spectrum is different, right? Their needs are different. Their levels are different. Um, but you don't ignore this stuff. And I, I feel like it's happening more and more and more because this diagnosis is exploding like crazy. Right. And there is so much need for support and services, but we're like behind on everything, right? There, there's such a lack of it right now. And, and I this is why I think now it's becoming more not not easier to diagnose, but I think people are finally accepting that it is a spectrum and that there are different levels. So I mm -hmm. think that now it's not, I'm not really sure the word that I'm looking for, but I think, like you said, it's exploding because now I think there's a, a, a level of acceptance like, okay, well, this is a spectrum. Not everybody is going to present this way. Some kids present this way. Right. You know, but they still need the the support. You know, right. So let's right. get that, that support, regardless of whether they're presenting this way versus presenting that way. Because, like you yeah. said, your son is is higher functioning. So is my son. Versus right. my nephew is not. You know, right. Right. But you know that doesn't necessarily mean that like your son and my son don't need the extra help you know right they they absolutely need it and i could tell you that although my son was like super high functioning when he was younger um now as he's getting older i feel like he needs more and more support and services so not that he's regressed but he's not really he's not developing as quickly as I think that he should. Right. So there, there is definitely the delay happening. I just feel like when he was younger, he could blend in better. And then like, you know, he's probably more like stuck at a certain age and, you know, people tell me, Oh, that's a boy thing. That's boys. You know, my mother tells me this all the time. Oh, your brother was <laughs> like that. And I'm like, no, he wasn't. <laughs> sorry but I grew up with him too and he was not like this you know like I don't know what you remember but I remember a different version than you do um so you know I don't like that as an excuse either that you know we we hear that so often like yes. oh they're they're just like this person in the family so what right so what you know if they are like the Theo or whatever Okay, but that doesn't mean that like, you know, 20 years ago when that person was that age, you right. know, that, you know, whatever wasn't done is okay for me to also not do it for my kid, right? You, you literally took the words out of my mouth. It's a very different time. And, you know, the resources were not available when Theo was acting like that and nobody knew what was wrong with Theo. You know what I mean? That doesn't right. necessarily mean that you're going to do that too. I 100%. Right on board with that but there is also that whole like shame of like oh you know this is not such a big deal oh this is nothing they're gonna grow out of it oh you know like people in our family don't have those things or something like that there there's no need to like continue that cycle of shame right. because I feel like it's so toxic. It's not helping anybody. Yeah. Um, there's nothing wrong with receiving a diagnosis. It's, it's actually a great 
thing if you have something to get diagnosed with it early so that you can get the help early uh -huh. on and not right. to like wait years and years. I, you know, right. I can't stress that enough, especially when it comes to kids, because the earlier you start things, the better they do only because yeah. their brains are like sponges and you're giving Absolutely. them a chance, right? Absolutely. You're giving them a chance to just catch up and do what they need to do. And great. If they, if they grow out of, you know, their speech delay or whatever, wonderful, right? right. Like, great. Then we don't even need that many years of this. It's exactly. wonderful. But you got to give your kid the fighting chance. Like, you know, just do what you got to do. And that's one thing that if there's any, any, anything that anyone can take away from this today, it's as cliche as it might sound, go with your gut because mm -hmm. <clears throat> I'm sorry. A lot of the times, you know, we, we trust so much in the pediatrician and our doctors and whatever. And I'm not saying that they are wrong, but we also have to keep in mind that this may not be their specialty right like this is why we have specialists th that do certain things uh, right. because that was um, you know my son's pediatrician he's great but when mm -hmm. i told him hey i'm noticing xyz i'm a little worried yeah. he told me that he said oh well we can wait yeah. yeah but i know the importance of early intervention and i said well I, you know i'm i'm not waiting and i i called on my own you know, yeah. and, it's and you not, can do that. You can yes, do that as a parent. You can call you early intervention yes. yourself. You don't have to wait for your doctor and parents, to do and it. And parents do not know that. You do not need a referral from the doctor. Mm -hmm. You do not need a prescription, at least not at the beginning. You know, mm -hmm. if your child is going to receive services, yes, you cross that bridge when you get there. But right, right. If let them do the evaluation. The, let them see whether they need it. The meetings, yeah. all of that, like, Parents can start that process without their doctor's green light, essentially, you know, yeah. and, and I'm happy that I started when I did because it took about three months for him to even yeah. get the evaluation right. scheduled. Right, you know? right, right. So, so then there's that delay of actually getting an evaluation done. Uh, and then there's a delay of assigning a therapist to you. So the, the faster you start, the better it is because better. the longer yes. you wait, the longer everything takes just to even get it started, especially 100%. these days, post pandemic, it's just way worse than yeah. ever. And, and a lot of therapists still don't want to go into the homes yeah, because of, you know, the post pandemic situation and it's, you know, not teletherapy is not for all children. I find that in my experience, the teletherapy for kids with special needs sometimes is even harder because there's just not that connection, I feel like. Yeah. Um, and for, for some kids, it works. So, right. you know, it, it really right. depends on the child, the individual okay. child. And also one thing that I want to say, um, because you, you talked about like the specialist, maybe this is not their thing, but... Um, also, I feel like nobody's an expert on your kid except you. <laughs> like oh, yeah. You're the expert on your kid. So yeah. it doesn't matter that I went to medical school for 12 years. It doesn't matter that, you know, I did all of that training. Your yeah. kid is what your expertise is on, right? right? I get to spend a few minutes with your child. Mm -hmm. You spend all day and all night with your kid. You know them in a way that I don't. And kids, when they see... <laughs> the the experts you know they they sometimes are like the best that day they are on oh. point they're saying all the things they're doing oh. all the behaviors great like you know and the parents are like i look like a liar and i'm like i believe you i believe you because i know that when this kid is not yes. here he acts totally different totally different kid yes 100%. Totally different. Totally different yeah kid. so i'm like don't worry i believe it and, and especially like now that i work in the schools even more so because I see the kids in their natural environment at school. And then like they're running into the medical room and they're like a whole, and I'm like, I know that you're not like this when you go to the doctor's <laughs> office. Because when you go to the doctor's office, you're afraid of the shot. And yes. you're like, let me, then, you know, they're like yes. very calm and cool and collected when they go to the doctor's office versus at the school where I get to see them. So I really get to see the the difference in, in the, their behavior. Right. Absolutely. So, and they're always going to behave. Fun. 
you know, kids are very comfortable around their parents. And yeah. even like sometimes kids behave a certain way with their moms and not their dads. Like, yeah. it, yes. really, yes. you know, yes. it really depends on the adult too, you know? So yeah. the situation, yeah. the environment, the adult, all those Absolutely. things. Absolutely. Absolutely. The behavior. Yes. Yes. It, that's, that's a thousand percent true. That is a thousand percent true. You're so right on that. Um, one thing that I wanted you to share with everybody, because I thought this was really important when you shared it at the event, was that you talked about how, you know, it's, what, what's the importance of if your child knows how to say airplane when we're not talking about airplane and I want them to have functional language that we could use every day, right? Yeah. And I, I was, I never thought of it like that. And I'm like, yeah, that's really important. Right. Like yeah. she's so right about this. This seems so simple, but how come people don't talk about this? This is really an important point. So I, I want you to talk um, on that, just on the functional language, right? Like how important that is and, and how as parents, we can ask for the things that we want to see in our goals for our child you know, it doesn't have to be just what they say. Absolutely. So um, I've, my therapy approach has always really been functional, you know, mm -hmm. um, with the adult population, sometimes after a stroke, you don't have the same abilities that you did prior to your stroke. So let's get that functional ability back. And with yeah. children, it's the same thing. And the reason that I discussed that during the panel was because, you know, I see it now with my son. Oh, he's, you know, he's going to name transportation. He's going to know feelings. He's yeah. going to say bus and train and airplane. And, and quite frankly, I, I don't care about that because if my son cannot tell me I'm hungry, I want water. Can I have a banana? Yeah. I'm tired. I want to sleep my diaper is wet if my son does not have functional language to communicate his basic needs and wants on a daily basis i do not care that he knows how to say airplane right because we're not talking about airplane right now if we go outside and there's an airplane overhead and he sees the airplane he says airplane great he right that relationship but right. at home he's not going to ask me for an airplane at home yeah. he's going to ask me for leche, for agua, for jugo, mm -hmm. for a banana, mm -hmm. whatever yeah. he wants. And that's what I need. So yeah. during, I remember during this meeting, they were, you know, talking about preschool concepts and this, that, I'm like preschool. My son is like, not even two. Like, what are we right. <laughs> I'm not worried mama. about that right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's got to care about, he doesn't even know how to say mama. Like, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, yeah. he, he doesn't call for me. He screams. And, yeah. and that's what I want to correct. I don't want him to scream for me. I want yeah. him to say mommy or mama yeah. to get my attention. Yeah. And, and yeah. I think that, it, it, again, I think it's just parents sometimes are scared to advocate for their, yeah. themselves and for their child. And I remember like when I was speaking to his therapist about functional goals, about his goals in general, that was right. one thing that I told all of his therapists. I said, I want functionality. I want mm -hmm. functional goals. I, I, I don't want my son to just list here and tell me the colors of the rainbow. I need him to tell me what's, what he wants. Yeah. Yeah. I need yeah. Him, if he wants a cracker or a, a, his water, I need him to say agua. I need him to say cracker or galleta. Yeah. I, I don't, I don't and to understand him. how to use it correctly and everything, right? Right. I don't need really um, him to say colors and transportation yeah, like we'll, we'll get there when we get there but first let's work 100%. on the really basic needs because and th this is why this is so important because the behaviors that we see so often right with young kids with autism those like meltdowns that everybody calls them it happens because they cannot communicate their needs right and so they get yep. frustrated and then you see these really like huge meltdowns. bursts of and yeah. like emotions right and they're they're yeah. called meltdowns or some people say it's bad behavior i'm like it's not bad behavior they're trying to communicate nobody's understanding and this right. is where what's resulting right so right. in order to cut that piece down right then we need to give them that functional language so that they can right. you know get their point across it's the frustration that is is causing yeah. that and you know maybe they won't be able to say words maybe they'll learn sign language maybe they'll use a device whatever it is but you know 
even a nonverbal child can communicate and they, they need to learn how to do that so that they're not feeling frustrated all the time and resulting in these behaviors, you know, where right. everybody's done running over and trying to calm the child down. And, right. you know, it's really hard, even when they're trying to get into school, it's, it's hard. It's really hard. And, you know, it's stressful for the parents, it's stressful for whichever caregivers, whether that's, you know, at, at a school setting or at home or grandparents or whatever, like give the child some way to communicate their needs. I think that's right. so important. And I wish that everybody took that point of view, because I think if you could at least start there, right, yes. then you build on that. So, Absolutely. Absolutely. you know, 100%. Once yeah. Once they have that basic functional language and they're able to yeah. communicate their everyday needs, then the language starts expanding. Like I said, yeah. if you go outside and you see a bus, oh, there's a bus. And now yeah. that is the appropriate setting to point to the bus. You know what yeah. I mean? But if, if we're at home, if we're in school, and like you said, maybe even the child may, may be nonverbal. So then let's teach yeah. them the sign language. So let's, you know, let's pair the word with the sign or yeah. let's create these communication boards for the child so that they can use their communication board to facilitate that functional language but a lot of the times you know we have these um i i feel like sometimes they're unrealistic and i and i don't mean that in a bad way i just feel like again there is not a one size fits all let's tailor the goals to this yeah. child let's set this child up for success because yeah. if again if this child is not able to call their caregivers by their names or even recognize their own name then right. why are we talking about other things that let's let's master the basic stuff first and then build from there you know yeah. and set the child up for success If you enjoyed this episode, share it with your family and friends. Also, join me for my group parenting sessions. I want you to be the first to know, so go directly to my website at www.drdivinalopez.com and share your email with me. That way you'll be the first to know when sessions start. Also, you can find me on Instagram at Dancing Into Parenthood and on TikTok at Dr. Divina Lopez. Also, if you like this podcast, please subscribe. That way you always know when a new episode drops. I love you. Bye. Please keep in mind that all advice given in this podcast is general information. To understand your specific situation, you must consult with your pediatrician.